Mazani. Uh, I have a PhD in civil and environmental engineering and uh, at Penn State Harrisburg, I teach courses related to water systems and hydraulic design. And my research is focused on design optimization and control of water systems, as well as the cybersecurity of water system. And I'm very excited to present some part of uh, like uh, fundamentals about water system uh, today. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jawad Khazai. I have a PhD in electrical engineering. Uh, I'm with the electrical engineering department at Penn State Harrisburg. And I'm also affiliated with the architecture engineering department at uh, University Park. Uh, my research is about integration of renewable energy sources to energy systems and uh, development of a smart energy management system for buildings and microgrid applications. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, basics in power systems and what uh, what are the main components of future uh, energy generation system. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to share some of my insights with you. Um, the workshop for today is going to have two parts. The first part, as you can guess, will be uh, about water systems, and we are not going into details about it, just some fundamentals, main components of water system. And then the second part of uh, the workshop will be about energy systems and also smart components in energy systems. Um, this is a, a water system of a city. And um, in general, a water system is composed of four main elements. The first element is a water treatment facility. And as you can guess, we cannot just drink the water out of uh, like in the, from the lake or from the streams or from the creek. You know that if you have ever been hunting or camping, you never, you know, you're smart enough. You know that you shouldn't dr uh, drink from that water because there are some viruses, bacteria in the water that can uh, really uh, harm us. So it's crucial that uh, the first step we are going, we can, we can treat that water to a level that is safe for us to drink. And that is what is happening in water treatment facilities. And the outflow of these plants is um, based on the standards of EPA, which is short for um, Environmental Protection Agency of the United States. And they make sure that the water that we are going to drink is not going to make us sick, okay? The first uh, component, the first main component of water system in general is going to be water distribution system. Why is that? Because even if the water is safe for you to drink, you need some system in place that can get the water from that water treatment plant and to your house or to your building to your business, right? But you don't see your parents going to water treatment facilities every day with a jog, you know, with a container to get water, right? And you don't see anyone delivering the water to you. So there is a system made of some components that get that water to you. That is called water distribution system, which is going to be the main focus of today's lecture. And the third component is the system that can collect the wastewater. And if you follow the red lines here, that shows the pipes that actually are going to collect the wastewater that we use. Again, unlike the trash that like uh, you have a container, you have a trash can, you put them in there and then weekly you put them outside and someone will take care of them. We don't do that with water. We don't have a huge container in the house that every time that we use the water, we just dump the water in the container and by weekly basis, someone comes and you know take care of it. No, we just use the water and it enters the system and that piping system will collect it. Why? Because it needs to be sent to wastewater treatment plants. You might ask me, okay, I get that why we need to drink, we need to treat the water that we drink because it can, you know, it can cause harms to us. But why would you care to treat the wastewater that we have already used? We don't need that. We're not going to do anything with it. So why can't we just dump it in the ocean? Why can't we just dump it in the Susquehanna River or any other lake? The reason for it is because there are other living organisms there that can be harmed by that. Because every time that we use water, we are adding some components to it. 
It could be chemical, it could be biological. For example, when you wash your hands or your clothes or your uh, dishes and, uh, you know, um, or, or you clean up the surfaces in your house, you're using chemicals and that chemical will directly get into the water. And if we dump it in uh, these, you know, environmental and surface waters, very soon we will see that we will have a nasty water and all the fish will die. It will affect the plants, it will affect the birds. So that's not an ecosystem, ecosystem that you want to have. Okay, so that's why we need to treat it, not as good quality as the water that we drink, but to a level that we know that it's not going to harm uh, uh, any, any animal or any, you know, anything in the ecosystem. Okay, so let's get focused on our uh, main component for today, which is the water distribution system. As we mentioned, water distribution system is a network that, that receives the water from treatment plants. And then it will, uh, through some processes, it will get it to our houses. And there are main elements to this network, um, such as reservoir tanks, pumps, valves, and pipes. And each one of these reservoirs are hugely critical to the network, to the water system, because even if one of them is not functioning right, we are going to, you know, we are going to pay the cost for it, literally. Um, the first one is a reservoir. I'm sure that you have seen reservoirs in your life, even, even though if you didn't know that was a reservoir. And mainly it's, it's a large body of water and it's usually surrounded with mountains because uh, the, the snow on the mountains will melt and they will get into this, you know, like lake form that we call it reservoir. Most of them are natural, some of them are man-made, but um, in like 99% of these reservoirs, you see dams. And the, a dam, as you can guess, has a couple of purposes. The first purpose, obviously, is to just let the water get accumulated in that area that we want, because we want to have storage so that we can use the water as much as we want. We don't want it to just flow through. We want it like in a safe place, you know, confined and uh, stored. So that's the that's the first uh, uh, first purpose for it. Another purpose for it would be that every time that you accumulate water, you have learned this from physics that as you increase the column of water, you're increasing the gravitational potential energy. So the moment that you let the water to, to be released from the dams, that, that gravitational potential energy will be converted into kinetic energy. You know that because energy cannot disappear, it can be converted from one form to another form. So when that happens, that water that is released has so much velocity and flow rate that it will allow the water to get to the, uh, the next stop, which is a treatment uh, you know, treatment plants. Sometimes we need pumps, we'll talk about them too. And the third purpose is uh, because when you put dams, you, it will allow you to generate electricity. I'm not going to talk about that because that's the topic for the next part of uh, the workshop. And there are some reservoirs around us. For example, this reservoir is in State College at Shingletown, Shingletown, Shingletown Reservoir that supplies water to State College or Middletown Reservoir supplies water to us. It's not just a body of water, it's beautiful too. People use it for recreational purposes as well. They go there, they fish, you know, they hike, they, they, buy, they, they take their bikes, you know, have a day out. So it's, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice addition to our environment, I might say. The next component of a water distribution system, which is as important as a reservoir, is the storage tanks. And you can see them in different shapes and forms across the city. Some of them are elevated, some of them are on the, gr on, uh, are on the ground. And again, the storage tanks also have different purposes. Uh, the one obvious purpose is the storage, because if we don't have uh, if we don't have tanks in the system, what happens is that the water treatment facilities that are going to supply water to our cities, they have to actually change the flow rate of the effluent based on our demand, based on our uh, hourly demand. And you can guess that like, for example, the water that you use at, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning is not the same as the water that you use at six o'clock in the evening because 
at six o'clock in, in the evening, everybody gathers, you know, people cook, wash dishes, you know, wash the clothes. So you have more water related activities at six o'clock in the evening that you don't have at 10 o'clock. So now imagine if the water treatment facilities want to keep up with these activities, they constantly have to change the flow rate of their effluent to make sure that you get the water. And this is almost impossible, let alone that it is extremely costly because they have to deal with so much fluctuations in the system. What we do is that we place these tanks so the water treatment plants are, can actually steadily provide water to these tanks and we store the water in the tanks and based on our need, based on our hourly need, we can change the flow rate of the output of the tanks. That's much easier because that's a storage. It's one way. So it's, it's less costly, it's safer, and you know, um, it's easier to do. That's one purpose of uh, the, the storage tank. The second one, which is really important too, is the pressure. So again, from physics, uh, I think you can remember communicating vessels, right? That you know that when you have vessels and containers that, that are connected to each other, the level of the water always wants to stay the same in all the containers, regardless of the shape. Now, imagine those containers as the buildings and different you know, points in your water system because they are all related to each other. Because we have set up the water tank at an elevated, you know, um, at, at, in an elevation, in an elevated altitude, and the water level is very high in the tank and everywhere else in the water system, they are connected to each other. So the water in those areas that are even higher than the ground, they also want to reach the same level of water as the water tank. So you never see water going uphill, right? You never see water going against gravity. But in this case, when you have pipes, because the water wants to reach the same level of the water of the tank, they can go upward. So that will provide enough pressure for them to go uphill. That being said, that being said, this can happen easily in a world without friction. However, in reality, this is almost true, but we need some push from the pumps. If I want to give you an analogy, I would say pumps for water systems are similar to the engine of your car, okay? Why is that? Because for example, assume that we were, we were living in a world without friction. It's not a good thing though. So just, just go with the example. The only thing you needed to do in order to use your car without even turning it on was that asking someone to push your car at your driveway, okay? According to Newton's law, that push is an external force. It will give acceleration to your car. And because there is no, um, uh, there is no friction, your car could you know, run forever. That's the same thing for water system. If we didn't have friction in the pipes, that what I, what I showed you, the communicating vessels and the level of the tank was enough to run the water up hills and to really tall buildings. But that's not true. A lot of that energy is wasted due to pressure of the pipes. So we need a driving force to push the water forward, similar to your car that uses the engine to push it forward. And there are different places that you see, you know, pumps, some of them are buried underground, especially if they are in the streets. For example, this one is, uh, is uh, at the corner of a parking lot. This is basically for stormwater and sewage, but for water systems are sometimes buried too. And the reason we bury them is simply because we want to protect them from the weather. We, we don't want them to corrode due to, you know, uh, oxidation or we don't want the snow to get into it. And even you, we don't want people to mess with it because anything that is in the side, there are always some people who want to know what it is, how it works, you know, open this, open that to see what it is inside. So to, to prevent all of that, we just, we just buried, uh, buried that on the ground. And there are different locations that you might see uh, a pumping uh, station or pumps in your water distribution system. One of them is anywhere that you need the water to go up because it's against gravity, right? So you need something to push it. You need some extra pressure 
to be able to move the water uphill or to lift the water. And for example, this pumping station is located at the upstream of this elevated tank because the water cannot go up in the tank by itself, you are using, we are using pumps to do that job. And when I say pump, pump station, it means that it is made of two or three pumps. Why do we need two or three pumps? Because sometimes you want to have an extra pump in case one of the pumps goes offline, needs replacement, needs maintenance, you can bring the other one online. So that one is like always a standby in case you need it. All right. Or sometimes the flow rate is so high that one pump cannot do the job. You add like two extra ones to, you know, all together can pump the water. So this is one example that you need to send the water upward. Another example, when you are when you have to give water to really tall buildings and you don't want the people who live like in the fifth floor on the sixth floor or 10th floor or 50th floor to not have water, right? So you put a booster pump. Booster pump means it boosts pressure. It boosts energy head to, to actually lift the water upward. And I put this here because this is a really good um, analogy of how pumps work. You have seen this thing um, in, uh, in cartoons or in old movies that, you know, in order to, people would use uh, like this handle, vertical handle to bring up water from the wells or from underground to the surface. Now imagine a pump working exactly the same function, but instead of somebody, you know, moving that handle, that is done by the motor drive of the, of the pump, which is a mechanical device. And the energy for that comes from electricity. So you use electricity and you convert it into some sort of mechanical work in order to lift the water from one point to another point. And in that process, you're adding the pressure to the water. Okay. At any point you have any questions, please go ahead and stop me. The next element, uh, which some people think it's not that important, but it's very important, is the valve in the system. We have different applications for the valves. For example, some of them are used to simply close or open a pipe or to, to regulate the flow rate of a pipe. For example, sometimes you need more flow rate, you open the, va the valve more. Sometimes you need less, you open it less. That's, it. That's the same thing as the valve of your faucet, okay? In the kitchen sink, for example. But most importantly, we use valves in places that we have extra pressure in the system. And you might say, okay, wait a minute, you just told me that high pressure is good because it will allow us to send water from a low point to a high point. Then how come out of the sudden you wanna control it here? Why would you reduce pressure then? The answer to that is yes, we want high pressure, but we don't want the pressure to go too high because there is always a maximum capacity that your system can tolerate. For example, in Pennsylvania, we, are, we don't design, the codes won't allow us to design system that allows the pressure to go above 75 PSI, okay? So this means that the system may not be able to handle that more than a pressure that is more than 75 PSI. And there are points in the system that the pressure goes really high. Give you an example. For instance, if the pipe is located at, in a like steep slope, Okay, you can imagine that the water that is coming downhill has a lot of kinetic energy. And again, we know that kinetic energy at the lowest point will be converted into gravitational potential energy, which increases the pressure, right? So that is one example where you have extra pressure. I want you to look at this gauge here, uh, the pressure gauge, and at the same time, this red uh, bottom of this spring. And you will notice that the moment that this, that this handle will reach that extra pressure, this red thingy will allow water to come into this um, area and it gives it more room and that will allow some of that pressure to be dissipated and it will decrease the pressure of the water. What happens if you don't have it? If you have too much pressure, your pipes can burst 
or it can damage the downstream pumps that they're expensive and you don't want that to happen because some people will be out of water if that happens. And this is like an outside view of a, uh, of a valve that you might see in water system. Finally, the last component of uh, water distribution systems are pipes. And they are the main body of water distribution systems because they are really the path of the water that passes through. So they are like the tracks for the trains. They are like the roads for the cars that without them, the water cannot, cannot move at all. That's the body of the water. And we have different types of pipes. We have different materials that make pipes for, for different purposes. Some pipes are made of concrete, some are made of uh, cast iron, some are made of PVCs. Um, and there are different sizes for the pipes too. For example, if you are using the pipe to, to supply water to the main neighborhood in uh, like to Middletown, you use like a 30 inch or 40 inch pipe size. But if you're using that pipe to get the water from your street to your house, which by the way, we call those pipes service lines, they are like six or eight inches pipes. These main pipes are called mains or arteries and they are really huge. Now I wanted to, um, to give you this thought that, why, okay, why do we bother, you know, making different size pipes? So why don't we use just 30 inch or 40 inch pipe size for all the pipes? It's conservative, right? We are sure that it can handle too much water. It's not going to be, you know, um, you are not going to have any problems. But why do you think we don't do that? Why do you think we don't make like all the pipes 30 inches or 40 inches? Any idea? Maybe because some places require more water than others. Um, like, you know, the water that our house or people use in houses is not the same amount that an industry um, or a college uses, so. That's, that's excellent, that's excellent. That and also, so, um, okay, so let's say that the highest, the largest pipe that we make that can handle all of that water is 60 inches, okay? Just, just imagine. Why don't we make all the pipes 60 inches, just to be sure? Why do we make six inches, eight inches? Because if you make it six, 60 inches, it's, you are sure that it will work for everywhere, right? Does it have to be with like, some sort of like, um, depending on the amount requires more pressure and that pressure, like, it's like a, a domino effect. Like if I had, you know, yeah, domino effect. <laughs> I like what you're, where you're going. I think you got it. So here's the deal. So imagine if I use a 30 inch pipe for these service lines that get the water from the street to your house, right? And now I want you to think about this, that if I give you a glass of water and I give you two straws, one of them is very thin, the other one is really fat and thick, which one is easier for you to drink the water with, the thin one or the fat one? Wouldn't be the fat one because there's like more space and like more. Right, but you would need to spend a lot of energy and sucking pressure to get you know, the water from the glass to your mouth, right? If it's too big. Yeah, that just remind me about the straws from, I think it's Burger King or McDonald's. Those, right. oh my God. <laughs> okay, right. so if I go through that analogy, that makes sense. Right, so if yeah. it's narrow and thin, you don't need to do any pressure on it. It will just flow in. So that's the same thing. If the pipes are too large, then one thing happens that the pressure will be dropped. Why is that? Because there's a, there is an inverse relationship between the diameter of the pipe and the velocity of the water in the pipe. If the diameter goes up, the velocity comes down. And when the, you have less velocity, eventually you will have less pressure. So if those pipes that don't need to be too large, if they are too large, then the water doesn't move at all in it. It will be stagnant in the pipes. You don't get one drop of water in your house. So 
as much as it is important for the big pipes that handle large amount of water to be really huge, it is very crucial for the smaller areas that we don't need that much of water to be, you know, in small size. So that's why we make, and plus it's extremely costly to make big size, you know, pop, uh, pipes. That's why it's very important for engineers to come up with the right size for the right amount of water, because otherwise you will have to have cranes to move those pipes. You have to really excavate to put those pipes in the, in the ground. They are huge. They, it's costly to make them that big. It takes a lot of material to make them. So you really shouldn't make them that huge unless you really need to, okay? Uh, all right, so, and there are some, um, now those are the components of water distribution systems. And even with all of those in place and being operated and controlled and maintained, there are always some issues with the water system. And the main one is the pressure drop. It happens when you go to the shower and you open the water, the shower head doesn't give you that pleasure, you know, pressure of the water that you want. And there are different reasons for it. The first one is the topology of the neighborhood. For example, if it's a flat, you know, area and you have friction, of course, then the water doesn't gain enough kinetic energy to give you enough pressure at your house. The second reason is the friction, as we said, all pipes, for example, in Middletown, there are most of the pipes were installed like more than 20 years ago. And as the pipes age, the, the friction in the pipe goes also high. And when you have high friction, you are, you're wasting a lot of energy. And that energy is the pressure that you're wasting. That's why your pressure gets dropped. The other one is the pipes blockage. So for example, look at this figure here. This is the original pipe size, and this is the current pipe size. And these are all precipitations of the chemicals and minerals in the water, because water has calcium, magnesium, you know, sulfate, phosphate, and all of these over time will precipitate in the pipes, and they small and they, they narrow down the, the passage of the water, and eventually you will end up having a very teeny tiny narrow of the water. And that will also decrease the pressure at your house. The leakage, if you have leakage anywhere in your pipes or in the valves, if they are not sealed in the fittings, that will also bring down the pressure. And finally, the extreme weather. I'm going to hold on to that because I'm going to come back to this in two slides later. And I want you to think about it. So I'm just going to skip that one. There are different solutions for this. One is to create slow for the flat areas. For example, if your area is, uh, is, is really flat, you don't have to have flat also piping because you can, you, can give, you can give slope to your piping system that will create some velocity in the water. Or you can decrease the size of the service lines. As I said, if you decrease the size of the, uh, of the pipe, it will increase the velocity and that kinetic energy will be converted into extra pressure in your house. Or we, we need to bury the pipes deeper to, to prevent uh, the damage that the, the extreme weather can have on them. I will come back to this or replace all pipes. A good practice would be every so often, we'll go check on the pipes. If they need to be replaced, we, we replace them, but this is costly. That's why it's getting you know pushed back. Uh, or install booster pumps. Anywhere that we have pressure drop, we can use some pumps to, to boost the pressure and try to identify the leaks. There are different ways that people use to identify the leaks. They use the smoking methods that they, they let the smoke go into the piping. And if they see them coming out of the ground, they realize that there is a leak in it. Nowadays, they use robots and we can use technology. So there are different companies that generate these small, teeny, tiny robots. They send them to the, to the pipes to identify where there is a crack or blockage. And then if there is one and if it is identified, then they can actually, they use a scrapper to push that blockage out of the pipe. And then they use really, they use heat and PVC to line the interior part of the pipe. So instead of replacing the entire pipe, they will have a new brand new lining in the pipe that not only will take care of the cracks, but also it will decrease the friction. 
And um, there are different companies do that. I, I don't want to advertise, but I took this picture from uh, New Flow Watch. Uh, New Flow Watch, yeah. Uh, new flu tech and there are different companies who do the same so this is not like specific to one company now i want you to answer this question knowing all of those that i just told you why do you think people were out of water in texas during this winter what happened to the piping what what is your guess why the water was frozen in the pipes Why we don't have, why our water doesn't, fr doesn't freeze in the, in the pipes in the winter? Does it have to be like with a problem in the pipes too? Like maybe there was not like an accurate maintenance or? Um... Let's assume that they maintain it really well. They were in all in good shape. They weren't very deep enough. So see, in our areas in the northeastern of the United States, the pipes are buried like 10 to 12 feet underground because we have winters and we, we, anticipate, we anticipate this and we bury them deep enough so that the water in the pipes won't get freezed, right? But in Texas, in Florida, in southern states, they never get that snow, that much of snow. It never gets that cold that the, you know, the pipes get, you know, they, the, the pipes freeze. So they never anticipated, like in Florida, it is like two feet below the, the surface compared to ours, which is 10 to 12 feet. The same in Texas. So what happened was that because it was extreme weather and it was too cold, the water in the pipes froze. And some of the pipes, and what happens when the, when the water freezes? It expands, right? So when it expands, it can, it can burst the pipe. And when the pipe is burst, even after that the freezing is gone, then you are dealing with, you know, extremely low pressure in your houses because, you know, there are so many burst pipes that now need to be fixed. But for that time being, they didn't have water because the water was frozen in the pipes. And for the reason for it was because the, the pipes were not deep enough in the ground. Now, at this point, you know how the water gets to your house. This is a profile of a typical usage of a household uh, for water as I don't know if you could guess or not, but toilets use like 20, almost 27% of our water usage compared to like showers that some people think showering is, uh, is water consuming, which is like seven, uh, 17%, like 10% toilets usage is higher than the showering. And like dishwasher is only 1%, 1.4%. And in, the, in, in Pennsylvania, a typical uh, family of four, they use like 66 gallons per day. Now I want you to go to this link, which is in the box and open that. And um, how, much do, how much time do we have, Maria? Yeah. You have time. Okay. so. Okay, thank you. So I want you guys to go to this link and calculate what is your water footprint in your water, in your household. And anything you don't know, you can just leave it as default. And I want you to type in your answers in the in the chat box and let me know if you are above the average water usage in Pennsylvania or you you are below that. And if you are above, what do you think you can do? To, to save some of the, your water usage. I have a, a quick question while they're waiting for that, um, working on it. Um, there's always been this, con um, I've always been told that sh uh, the showers uh, consume less water. Is it that more people take showers than baths? that the percentage of water use or is there a different reason um that's a great question unfortunately we don't have data that separates taking bath with shower 
because for example, when people report their showering time or the bath time, they just combine the two. Like mm -hmm. for example, I have an assignment for my uh, hydraulic class that they are uh, supposed to monitor their water usage for a week and report back their water usage. And not even once have I seen that they report it separately. Wow. Okay. But I guess your assumption, your uh, answer is accurate that more people take showers than, you know, take a bath. And so that's why the showering part is, uh, is stronger and, you know, is more highlighted than taking a bath. Although taking a bath takes a lot of water. <laughs> if someone wants to do it like as frequently as taking a shower, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, we are in trouble. Every day, twice a day. <laughs> oh my God. Can you imagine? No. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So I don't know if there's a faster way to use um, the page because like it says I have to install and then download an app and then do other stuff. So I'm like, that's what. Oh, really? Because yeah. see, I just clicked on it and this is what, what, this is what it gave me. You don't need to do this, the start part. You just need to do that and then hit calculate. All right, let me, let me. Is it working for you now, Monica? Okay. Yeah. I'm actually doing it uh, for our household. See, we can compare it. When you're done with it, if you could just raise your hand and let me know that you're done, that'd be great. So are we supposed to put a, the answer in the, the chat that we got? That would be nice, yeah. So that, uh, what what did you get? Um, I got 70, Three, oh wait. So you're almost uh, at the level of the average, a little bit higher. What do you think you can do in order to reduce it a, a little bit more? Um, Other than not flushing the toilet. <laughs> yes, shorter showers. I'm not sure because it just ha it has different numbers for the averages here. Okay. Yeah. Um, probably shorter showers for me. Or some people like run uh, dishwasher every day or they run, you know, laundry, uh, the uh, washer every day. So that we could reduce that. We could use smart, um, smart uh, shower heads, smart faucets, you know, 
you know, an easy way would be to throw in a brick inside the tank of the toilet. That will get, that will reduce the volume of the, uh, of the tank. And every time that you flush, you're using less amount of water. So these are different ways that, you know, people can do. And whenever you guys are done, uh, I will be done too. And uh, it was such a great pleasure talking to you guys and, and presenting this. And I will give the mic to Dr. K. But whenever you guys are done, so. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We're giving you a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Dr. K, are you able to pull up your, okay. Yes. I also wonder, does it help at all with uh, COVID because people at home, you know, if there was a difference in the percentage? <laughs> Absolutely. Because um, if you compare it with pre, pre before COVID, uh, so people were home only during the weekend time mm -hmm. and you could see it, you could see an obvious spike in the weekend compared to like Monday through uh, Friday. But right now, since most people are working remotely, the, you will see a pretty uniform, you know, profile for the entire week. And that is actually a great question because I have had compared this for students because I had this homework this semester, past semester and last year. And I showed them the difference between mm -hmm. the water usage for the week before COVID and after COVID. So you're absolutely right. It has a significant effect on it. Okay. And if there was an increase or a decrease? <laughs> increase, actually increase. <laughs> okay. Great increase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, shall we start? Absolutely, go for okay. it. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the modern energy network and what the main components are. Uh, this, this picture shows uh, a structure of uh, the electricity generation system. Uh, we start with uh, power plants. I'm gonna talk about these in detail. Uh, we send the power through transmission system. So this is a transmission system. And the main purpose for generating power is for us to consume in our appliances, for example, at houses or industrial facilities, they run their business by running different kinds of motors and, and electricity consuming devices. So our purpose is to send the power from the power plants to uh, the customers, which are us. This was the structure of the old energy system, but now we have many components added to it. For example, we have a smart uh, solar generation system, wind turbines, we have electric vehicles, car charging stations, and these are the mo main components of modern um, energy network, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this picture shows uh, a basic structure of uh, energy generation. It starts with power plants. We have different types of power plants, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, once we generate the power in the power plants, we want to send it to, uh, let's say, customers, which are us, and we are gonna consume it at, at, at home. Uh, and the process it seems to be very simple, but it gets challenging because of the distance that we have from power plants to uh, the houses. Because of this far distance, which normally is in terms of 100 miles, uh, we have to transmit the power through uh, long transmission cables. So we have to have the cables because of the losses. So if you wanna just use one cable, send it directly 400 miles away, uh, at the end, when you're measuring your power, it's going to read zero. So because of the losses that you have in, in the process of transmission. So one way to avoid this would be increasing the voltage to a much higher level so that you reduce the amount of current and the amount of losses that you have through the transmission. And once you reach out to your houses, you use transformers to step the voltage down uh, to a level that we use. And we will see all these voltage levels uh, today in the uh, in the presentation. So what are the main components of energy generation system? 
power plants are the main ones. They generate power for us. We have transmission system to send the power to the customers. We have distribution system to distribute the power between the customers in different, uh, let's say, locations. And then we have customers, which are us. We consume electricity. Uh, modern systems, they in integrate renewable energy generation, electric vehicles. We have car charging stations. And we talk about some of smart appliances as well today. So let's start with power plants. The first type of power plants that we, we want to study today is uh, thermal power plants. Uh, why do we call it thermal? Because we use thermal energy uh, to generate electricity. And we have three different types of thermal power plants. We, uh, we have coal-based, natural gas, and nuclear. Uh, why do we, we have different types? The structure is exactly the same. The way that we generate the power is by burning a fuel and boiling the water. And then we will use the water, uh, actually the boiled water, which creates a steam. We will use the steam to rotate a shaft or a turbine. And then after the uh, turbine rotates, you can rotate the generator's shaft and then create electricity. So based on the type of fuel that you use to uh, boil the water, the type of power plant is decided. So if you use coal, if you burn coal to generate heat, that's called the coal power plant. If you, if you burn gas, natural gas to generate heat and, and uh, create a steam, that's called the gas, natural gas power plant. And if you use a nuclear fuel to, uh, uh, let's say, boil the water, that's called a nuclear power plant. Uh, but all these power plants, thermal power plants, have one component in common. And they all have this component, which is called the generator. Uh, this picture shows the size of a generator that you normally see in a power plant. Compared to a person which is uh, uh, actually beside it, it's huge. Um, the amount of power that it generates is in a range of 600 megawatts. Uh, compared with the, uh, let's say, phone charger that you have, you consume 10 to 12 watts. And we are talking about 600 million times of that. So this is a huge power generating uh, system. Uh, which normally includes in power plants, it has two parts. One of them is the stationary part, which you can see in this picture, we call it the stator. Uh, and the other one is, is the rot rot uh, rotatory part or a rotor, because it, it rotates and it creates electricity for us. The process is shown here. Uh, this circular part is uh, the stator, which you see here. And, and this element here is the rotor. The rotor normally acts as a magnet. Uh, so when you rotate the rotor, these stator uh, system or the stator has winding in it. So once you rotate the rotor and the rotor has permanent magnet, you induce voltage in these windings. And since you have three of them, you generate three, uh, we call it sinusoidal waveforms or voltages. And this is what we use for our appliances. Why do we use three of them and not one? because it's cheaper for us, because uh, if you generate three phase, you have less losses, your system is more efficient, and it's easier to transmit in terms of, uh, let's say, distance. If you want to uh, transmit three single phase ones, you would need six wires. But if you have three phase, you only have three wires. And your power is three times the single phase one. So it generates more power, less noise, and then more efficient. That's why we use three phase. But in our houses, we only use one of these sine waves for our appliances. For example, one of these would go to our washer and dryer or our TV. So they consume only one of these sinusoidal waveforms. So this is the, uh, actually, this is the part which is common in all of those power plants. Now, let's take a look at the coal-based power plant. This, this figure shows how a coal-based power plant works. So you supply coal as a fuel to your boiler. This component is called boiler. So you burn the coal to generate heat. And then you have a water tank on top of the boiler uh, that boils the water, creates high pressure steam. And you send the steam to a turbine. The turbine rotates. The turbine shaft is connected to the, the rotor part of the generator. So once the turbine rotates, the generator rotor also rotates. And then in the output, you generate a three phase power. Uh, and then to close the cycle, once you use the steam to rotate uh, uh, the turbine, the low pressure steam comes to a device called condenser. 
and it, it is converted from a steam to water, the water goes back to the water tank that we had. So this closes the cycle so that you won't need to supply water uh, from another source. So this is a closed cycle uh, electricity generation system. Uh, this is a structure of a nuclear uh, power plant. You can see it's, it's almost identical. Uh, the only difference is that instead of a boiler, you have a reactor, nuclear reactor, which basically burns, uh, uh, boils the water, creates a steam, and then this, the process from now on is the same. You have a turbine that rotates, the turbine shaft is connected to the generator shaft. Once the generator shaft uh, rotor rotates, you generate electricity in your system and you send to, uh, let's say, your customers. Uh, this is a type of uh, power plant, which is called natural gas power plant. The difference, again, is on the type of fuel that you use. So in this case, we use natural gas. We, we burn the gas to generate heat. Again, the heat is uh, used to boil the water. The water is converted to steam. The steam is sent to the generator, and the generator generates electricity for us. Now, this is the type of uh, power plant that was uh, 46 I would say more than 40% of Texas uh, power would come from natural gas. And this is one of the main reasons Texas failed uh, to provide electricity to the customers during uh, the, the past few days that we heard uh, during the time of the snow and cold weather. The reason was the pipes that would supply natural gas to the power plants would uh, uh, froze. So you had a frozen natural gas system which could not deliver natural gas to the generators to generate power. And that was the main reason. And since they relied so much on natural gas, their 46% of their power would come from natural gas. That's why the system failed when the 40% of their generation failed and resulted in a blackout. Uh, so this is something that uh, Dr. Mazzini briefly talked about. Uh, this, this is what we call hydro uh, power plants. In the United States, we have more than 80,000 dams. And on any dam, you can install a hydro plant. The system is like this. You, uh, you install a generator. So compared to a thermal power plant, which uses a steam to rotate the turbine. In this case, water directly rotates the turbine. So the process is exactly the same. You have a generator. You need to rotate the rotor part to uh, create electricity. In this case, the, the component that rotates the rotor is water instead of steam. So that's, called, that's why we call it hydro plant. It's installed mostly on dams where you have enough pressure uh, from water to rotate the uh, rotor part. And one, can you just give me a guess? We have more than 80,000 dams in the United States. Can you just guess how many hydropower plants we have in the system? Just throw in a number out of 80,000 dams. Forty thousand? <laughs> 40,000, that's a good number. I wish it was 40,000. Uh, we have 2,400 uh, hydro plants. So we are not using the full capacity of hydro power generation because of many reasons. The first one is that this system is very slow because of uh, uh, the flow of water in the system. It's very difficult to design. That's the first one, requires a lot of maintenance. It's very expensive. And, and of course, it's very slow. In case something goes wrong in your system, you want your power generation system to act as fast as possible. But because this system relies so much on uh, water flow, and that's the slow process, the, uh, this is not very common in the system. But thermal power plants, they are very common but they are the main sources of uh, carbon emission in electricity generation because you're uh, burning fuel and that uh, produces uh, uh, em emissions. So uh, in future, we would like to have more renewable energy sources in the power generation system. Uh, this is also another application of uh, hydropower plant. This is called pipe, uh, pump hydro plant. Uh, so we use the elevation difference uh, when you, you have uh, two reservoirs, one, of, one is called upper reservoir, the other one, the lower reservoir. Uh, during the day, you use electricity uh, to uh, actually pump the water from the lower reservoir to the upper reservoir. And during the night, when you need electricity, uh, you would, for example, convert this uh, process 
you send the water from upper reservoir to the lower reservoir, and this water acts as a hydropower plant, rotates uh, the shaft of this pump, and this pump is converted to a turbine. You generate electricity and send to the system. So this is a two-way uh, uh, ge energy generation system. One way it consumes power, in the other one it, it generates power whenever you need. But again, the problem with this system is that this system is also slow because of the reliance on the water system. Uh, now, this brings us to the transmission and distribution uh, of power. So we discussed uh, power generation systems and uh, what are the different types of power plants that we have in uh, electricity generation system. Now, it comes to the transmission system. The generator normally operates at the one, the huge one that I showed you, that, that operates at 25,000 volts. So that's the voltage of uh, a, a power plant. But for us to send uh, that power to our customers, for example, residential customers, which are us, we consume 120 volt and 240 volts. This is what you measure if you install a multimeter in the outlet, in one of the outlets at your home. Uh, some industrial facilities, they, uh, they use higher voltages because of the machinery that they have. So, so some of them use 13,000 volt or some of them 4,000, some 69,000, some 26,000. So it depends on the size of uh, power components or machines that they use in, in the industry. But so this is called the distribution system level. And then we have another one, which is transmission system. At transmission system, uh, we increase the voltage as much as we can. We increase it to, for example, 765,000 volts, 500,000 volts, three, uh, 345, 230 and 130 kilovolt or, or 138,000 volts. The reason is if you increase the voltage, you reduce the current, and then that means you reduce the amount of losses that you have in this transmission. So you minimize uh, the losses, uh, amount of power that you lose uh, during the, the transmission of the power. So that's why we increase. Most of the high voltage transmission lines that you see uh, around, uh, let's say Harrisburg, they are rated at 138 and 230. So we, we don't have uh, 345, 500 and six, uh, 765, mainly because of the distance because we have so many power plants close to Harrisburg area, it doesn't require a long transmission. But when you have a very long transmission system, you normally use a higher uh, voltage rating. So if, if your transmission line is more than 400 miles, yes, you would use 500 kV or uh, 765,000 volt uh, power. So to address the global warming, we recently started looking into renewable energy sources. One of the, one of the most common ones that we uh, have installed in our system is the solar uh, generation, where you install solar panels on your roof, and then uh, you have, a, have an AC panel that would control the amount of power that you generate from the solar. Now I'm going to get into details of how uh, solar uh, energy is converted to electricity. Uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, picture. So you have the energy from the sun, uh, and then this is a solar panel at, at your home. It has two electrodes, uh, positive and negative electrodes. When the sunlight uh, receives, uh, actually is received by the panel, electrons would move from the negative uh, electrode to the positive, and they create a current in the system. And that current can be used uh, to, let's say, uh, this is an electricity which is used to power up, for example, our appliances. Uh, we have two types of currents in, in the system. The power which is generated by a solar panel is called direct current. That means if you measure it over time, it's going to give you a constant value every time that you measure. But our appliances at home, they all use alternating current. So if you take a look at the power or the current that is consumed by a TV, that's just going to be this curve, a sine wave. The power which is consumed by, by our washer, dryer, refrigerator, all of them use it, uh, alternating current. So in that case, we have to somehow convert uh, the uh, DC power, which is generated by solar, to an alternating current. And this is normally done by a converter device, which is called inverter. That means once you have a solar panel, you install an inverter, uh, that converts direct current to alternating current, and then you can use it for your appliances. What are appliances that you have? You can do the same thing with batteries. Batteries also uh, produce direct current, and then you would need an inverter to convert it to uh, alternating current. Uh, this is what an inverter looks like. 
So if you open an inverter, if you purchase an inverter and look at uh, inside of the inverter, it's made of capacitors, inductors, uh, and, and some uh, transistors, which are power electronics devices. So um, these devices would, would work to convert your, uh, let's say, direct current to an alternating current, which can be controlled. So this inverter can control uh, the amount of voltage and the amount of current that is being sent to your appliance. And everything is done through microcontrollers uh, that are installed in the inverter. Uh, for the residential solar energy application, uh, we use solar panels in our roofs, and then we sometimes pair it with a battery, and then we send the direct current energy to an inverter that converts our uh, DC power coming from the solar and battery to an AC, and this is connected to, an, uh, to our AC panel at house. Uh, during the day, we use the solar and battery, but during the night, since we don't have any solar, we can use the battery and we can get energy from the grid uh, to power up our, our appliances at home. This is another application for wind energy. Uh, the process is the same as thermal power plants. So you have a generator and, and in, at each generator has the stationary part and the rotor uh, part. You have to rotate the rotor to generate electricity. And in the wind energy, that rotation is coming from the wind. Uh, but the problem is that these generators need to be rotated at a speed, for example, around 15, uh, 1500 revolution per minute to 2000 revolution per minute. But what is the speed of wind? This is around eight meters per second to 12 meters per second. And that's much lower than what this generator needs. So you would need a gearbox in the middle that would convert this low speed coming from the wind to a high speed that can be used for uh, the gen generator system. And then you have control over uh, this generator unit. So this is how a wind turbine generates electricity. And, and then you can use the gen generator power to send to the grid. So if you have many of them, then you can get uh, a large power. For example, in, in our system around Pennsylvania, all those wind turbines that you see if you drive by, from uh, here to, for example, Pittsburgh, you will see a lot of wind turbines is installed there. And these are all, uh, actually each turbine is uh, rated at two megawatt, meaning 2000 uh, kilowatt, uh, for example, uh, rating. Uh, let's look at another application, electric vehicles. Now uh, you might uh, wonder how they work and, uh, and what is the difference. So the main part is a battery pack. So you have a battery pack in, in the electric big, uh, vehicle uh, that generates direct current. So that's a DC. And then you have an electric motor. So instead of uh, a combustion system, you have an, an electric motor, which would need electricity to, to rotate. So this is a opposite of generation system. In generator, you rotate the rotor, and then you induce voltage in the winding, and that voltage is used for generation of electricity. In the motor, the process is reversed. That means you send electricity to the motor and you, uh, you get mechanical power from it and that drives the car. So this motor requires alternating current. That's a three phase motor, but the battery gives AC uh, power. So you would need a device in between, which is called the inverter. That inverter converts your DC power to AC and then that's what you send to the motor. You can control the speed of your motor using this uh, power electronic device, which is inverter as well. Okay, uh, there is a new concept in energy system, which is called uh, vehicle vehicle to grid or V2G. So that's when you connect your electric vehicle to the grid. This is this is going to happen in near future. Let's say you go to work, uh, you come back around 5 p.m. Uh, you have an electric vehicle. So in near future, this is going to be very affordable for every household to have an electric car, and then a ca charging a station. This is a car charging station, which is installed for each house. So you will purchase one. This is very cheap compared to the electric uh, vehicle price. You will add one of these to your house. You come back at, uh, let's say, 5 PM. You plug in your electric vehicle to the charger. And the utility company, the electricity company, signs a contract with you that whenever you're at house and you plug in your vehicle to the charging station, they can take over and they can control your uh, let's say car charging a station and also the uh, battery that you have in your car, but they will promise that 
the day after at 6 a.m your car is fully charged so they will use the battery that you have in your car to provide power to the customers that they have overnight so from 5 p.m to 6 a.m the day after they will use your car and then at 6 a.m your car is fully charged you can again go to work you don't need this car you don't need the battery uh, but the grid would need that. So this is called, this concept is called V2G or uh, vehicle to grid. So you would use your electric vehicle to support some customers. And in return, they, sometimes they would pay you or they would, re they would reduce your electricity bill. So these are some of the concepts that you can use. Um, let's take a look at your electricity consumption at home. So if you have uh, a light bulb, let's say a 100 watt light bulb uses one kilowatt hour in 10 hours. So that means if you turn this light on for 10 hours, your consumption is gonna be one kilowatt hour energy, okay? Electric oven, if you run it for one hour at 180 degrees, you're, you're consuming two kilowatt hour energy. And some examples, like, like the toaster, if you use your toaster for one hour at 180 degrees, you're consuming 0.33 kilowatt hour. So, and add them up, that would be your, monthly power consumption that would result in your electricity bill. And I wanna know how much power, uh, let's say residential uh, customers would use every year. So the average in the United States is 10,649 kilowatt hours per year. So this is the total power consumption of a household over one year period. If you divide it by 12 and take the average, it's gonna be around 877 kilowatt hour per month. This is the total power that every household consumes in the United States per month. And if you divide it by 30, this gives you a daily power consumption. It says every day you would consume between 25 to 30 kilowatt hour. Okay. And you just saw an example. If you run your oven for one hour, that's two kilowatt hour. So that means two of this is gone and you have, let's say 23 more left. And that would be consumed by the microwave, electric oven. You have air conditioning. Air conditioning is the worst. That consumes the most energy, especially, especially at this time. Uh, the heater consumes the most. So that's how you can calculate the amount of power that you're using per day. Uh, but I'm interested to see how much power is uh, consumed on a daily, uh, on an hourly basis over one day. So this uh, black curve shows the power consumption of a household over 24 hours means if I start recording my power consumption at my house at, at 12 a.m. and I stop recording at 12, uh, let's say 11.59 p.m., this black curve will, will be the power consumption, which makes sense. Overnight, I'm sleeping, so I'm not consuming much energy. During the day, uh, it, it goes up when I get up, right? And then when I come home around, let's say 4 p.m., I start running the TV, cooking, so my power consumption goes up, right? Uh, what is this red and, and yellow area? This, this is when you have a solar uh, at your home. So when you have uh, a solar, for example, system installed on your roof, overnight, you don't generate any solar. That's why it's zero. But around 8 a.m. when sun rises, you start generating solar energy and you support your load using solar. That's why your power consumption goes down. That means solar is supporting some portion of your uh, power generation. And then it goes down at, at around 12 uh, uh, at, at noon, you generate the maximum solar uh, power. That's why your power consumption goes down as much as you can. And then it goes up as uh, the sun starts to set and around, uh, 5 p.m. when the sun sets, you don't have any solar, um, and then your, your power consumption goes up. Now, let's take a look at another uh, case when you want to take a look at uh, different types of solar panels. Uh, this one, so if you install solar panels that can track the sun, you get the maximum power. So this curve shows how much power you're getting from a solar over uh, a few hours in your system. So the yellow one, is the maximum power. This means if you have a solar tracking system at your home. But if you don't have any solar tracking, but you just install your solar panels uh, such that they face south, you generate, again, good power. This is very close to maximum. The difference between these two, the tracking one is more expensive. 
So if you want your panel to rotate with sun and extract the maximum power, so you have to pay more. But if you don't, if you don't want to spend that much money, you can just uh, go with no tracking uh, and, and then tilt your uh, solar panel towards south and that generates almost close to the maximum. So that's how they design the solar system in, in the United States. Uh, this is called the duck curve. Uh, this is the uh, load uh, profile that I just showed you, the black curve. And this shows the total power consumption in California. Uh, starting to 2013, there were not uh, many solar panels installed. So you don't see any drop in, in the load curve. But around 2020, we have many houses that uh, have, for example, solar system installed. That's why the solar drops uh, uh, the duck curve because it looks like a duck. If you take a look at this curve, so this is a very famous curve in the system, and this has resulted in many problems uh, in the system because from the time that the solar goes off till your load goes off, so this is called the ramp power. So you need to turn on your conventional power generation units to, to pick up this ramp uh, in, in your load. And sometimes this results in instability in the system. Now, I just, uh, I'm almost close to, um, uh, towards the end. I want to take a look at the electricity prices in the United States. So looking at Pennsylvania, you are paying 8.47 cents per kilowatt hour uh, energy that you consume at your house. Now, you saw that the average was around 25 uh, to, let's say, 30 uh, kilowatt hour per day, or around 900 kilowatt hour per month, multiplied by, by this number, 8.47, that would be your uh, electricity bill, around $80, $90. So that's, that's the average uh, uh, bill that you pay. So looking at the other states, you see in Florida, for example, is higher, 9.67. Texas is cheap, 7.88, and in California, it's, it's 14. So uh, you, you see that different states pay, uh, pay more, for example, for, for the electricity. Now we want to calculate. So what, what we want to do is um, you can take a look at uh, this website. I want to show you. So if you uh, click on this link, this which uh, we included in the chat, it opens a website, which I'm going to open now. And we want to calculate uh, the amount of power, uh, power in our, let's say, household. So if you uh, click on the link, this page will show up. This is uh, coming from the National Renewable Energy Lab, or NREL. Uh, Excuse me. Um, you yes. have to share again, because it does. Um, we cannot see the Do you the see the website. chat? Do oh, you wait, see? are you trying to? Yeah, it should be in the chat. Do you okay. see the chat box? Yeah. Okay, you can just click on that link. And then this should bring up, uh, bring up this page. Once you have sharing. this page. You're not sharing the page. Okay, let's see. I'm not sharing it. No, it's still on that PowerPoint. Okay, let's see. It's, it's working. Okay, so do you see this page when you open that? Okay, um, start with your zip code. I, I, I put mine there and then click on go. It, it takes you to the new page. Uh, first shows your, let's say where you're located in the map, shows you the latitude and longitude of your house. And then once, once you see that you can go to the system information, just click on this. It brings you to the new page where you, where you can use it to calculate the amount of power um, you wanna generate and the amount of saving that you will have. So if you remember, we had, um, Monthly consumption of, of let's let's look at daily. So daily power consumption at United States is around 25 to 30. But when you want to install, uh, a, let's say, solar system for your house, you would install uh, towards 10% or, or sorry, 30% to 50% of the capacity that you have. Let's say, uh, and this is in kilowatt. If, if I'm consuming 25 um, kilowatt hour per day, I would install a 12, for example, kilowatt solar system in my house, half of it, almost half of it, to see um, how much I need to pay and how much saving I will have. Uh, here you can choose the, uh, the solar system type. If you click on this 
small error. So you can just use this standard form. This is the cheaper option. The array type I'm going to use. So if you click on it, it allows you to select a roof mount. I want to install my solar panel on the roof. And I don't want any tracking. That's going to be expensive. And I don't have a space in my backyard to install uh, the tracking one. So I'm going to just install on my roof. Uh, system losses, just because this is a standard 14% system loss is, is reasonable. This is tilt is the angle of your roof. So I'm considering minus, let's say 20 degrees, but in your case, it's more, you can, you can change this angle, for example, to 30 degrees. Uh, as, azimuth is uh, the angle from the north. So if you have 180, that means your panel is uh, facing towards the south. So if you install your panels, South facing, you, you will get the maximum power as we discussed. This is the residential. And then for the electricity prices, I'm going to look at the Pennsylvania price. It was uh, 8.47 cents. So I'm going to use that number. So that means 0 0.087. And then once I'm done, I'm going to move to the next step. And this tells me, uh, this is the breakdown of uh, my system. This is the, uh, the power that I'm generating in, 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 let's say, one year. In January, as an example, this is the average uh, solar radiation, which I'm going to get in, in my zip code. Uh, this is the amount of saving that I'm going to have on my electricity bill. I will save $88. And this goes down to every year. And eventually tells me, in one year, I'm saving $1,339 in my electricity bill. So. You can, uh, I don't know if you have time, it's almost uh, six, uh, but you can try it at home and, and uh, come up with the, let's say, the amount of power that you are generating using your solar panel and the amount of saving uh, that you will have by installing a solar system. So this gives you an idea how you can design a solar system for your, for your house. Is there any question for me? I have two questions. Sure. So the first question is about the coal plant. Mm -hmm. um, so like I was curious if there's any other material that have the same um, output that can get the same output. Um, and also like what are the benefits are, of using that specific material like the coal? Coal? Because uh, I think the main reason behind using coal was its availability. So they had access to coal mines a few years ago. And this is, this is redundant, uh, not redundant. It's, it's available, freely available in the United States. That's why they started using it. If you want to use other material, so it might be more expensive. And uh, in that case, your electricity price would go, go higher. That's why you see in natural, so natural gas is an alternative. So instead of burning coal, you can use natural gas, which is more clean, but it, but is more expensive. So that's why there is a lot of pushback for using natural gas in many states. They are still using coal because if it, if they want to switch to natural gas, they have to pay more. The customers, actually us, we need to pay more uh, for the power which is coming from a natural gas. That's why th they don't want to do it. Okay, thank you. And then the second question. It was about um, you had a slide and which has like generator and then something in between and at the end the distribution. Mm -hmm. um, I think you mentioned that like if yeah. voltage increases, current decreases, and I don't know if I heard wrong. Um, I was just trying to relay that to Ohm's law, which oh, is voltage okay. equals current mm -hmm. times resistance, um, and I don't know if resistance plays a role. Exactly. Um, okay. That's exactly the Ohm's law, because these transmission lines here are modeled by simple resistor. Okay. So if you increase the voltage, so the amount of losses in the system is modeled by R times I squared. We call it R I squared uh, losses. Okay. So the amount of power that you lose in transmission line is directly proportional to the square root of the cur uh, current. But considering the power Power is voltage times current. And this power is coming from this power plant, which is fixed. So if you're sending a fixed power, if you increase the voltage, you're reducing the current. That means you're reducing the RI squared, which is the power loss. So that's the main reason behind 
increasing the voltage so that we can reduce the current at the same amount of power. And then if you reduce the current, R squared will uh, reduce significantly. Okay, and it, yeah, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And in terms of like either, um, you know, like circuits parallel or in series, like is, does that play also a role in exactly. this? And is there any a specific circuit that it's better than the other one? Exactly. So if you take a look at transmission lines, you will see that in each tower, you have, instead of three lines going out, you have multiple. Each phase will, has, will have four lines going with it. That means you install four lines in parallel, the total impedance will be reduced by four. So that's another way of reducing the losses in transmission. So you install multiple lines in parallel when you're sending it, that brings reliability because in case one line fails, the other one is in place. But the main reason behind using that is uh, installation of lines in parallel would reduce the impedance, then ROI squared would, would reduce as well. Okay, and then since they're in parallel, all of the lines are experiencing the same voltage, right? Exactly, All right. exactly. At the same yeah. voltage level, you reduce the current by four times. That means you're reducing your oh. losses by 16 times because it's already squared. Yeah, I'm just trying to relay because I took uh, physics 251 and we went over this and I was just trying to like make connections between them. But, so thank you so much. Of course, of course. That These two were very good questions. I like how you look at these problems. Could I ask another question about that? Of course, please. Um, so did you say that you increase the voltage so that you can decrease the current? Exactly. Okay, I was just confused on that because that I thought that the current was um, equal to like voltage over resistance. So I was wondering why increasing voltage would decrease current. Okay, so look at the power. Uh, power is voltage times current. And this gener generation system uh, generates a constant power, let's say 600, just as an example. So if you're generating 600 watts, as an example, and your voltage is 100, then your current is going to be 6 amps, right? V oh. times I. Okay, but, so it's a constant power. Exactly. So your power is constant. Now, if you increase your voltage to 600, your power is also 600, your current will reduce, and that's going to be 1 amp. So you're reducing your current, uh, your current by 6 times by increasing the voltage. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else with questions? Anyone else questions for anybody? Well, thank you, Dr. K. We're giving you, you a so virtual much. applause. Um, we appreciate both the presentations were very informative. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs> Without you. pleasure. Yeah, I just want to make a comment. Um, I'm really, I like the way both of you connect each material because I saw very like a few similarities between each other. Um, I took a few notes because I'm a biology major, but it's it's good to know like from other like physics and all this stuff. So thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a good day. And, and thanks for clarifying all the Texas. Now I'm like, <laughs> light goes on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for coming. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye.